Welkom in TechMag. Ik ben Magali en elke week nodig ik een interessante persoon bij mij uit voor een boeiend gesprek. Vandaag doen we het via Zoom met Pieter Abeel, Vlaams hoogleraar en robotica onderzoeker in Silicon Valley, die zelfs al samenwerkt met Elon Musk. Ik vraag hem daar alles over en hij vertelt ook over wat hem vandaag bezighoudt en de toekomst van artificiële intelligentie. Veel kijk of luisterplezier. Hi, Pieter. Dag Pieter. Goedemorgen. So we're going to do this interview in English, right? It's easier for you. That would be great. <laughs> well, how have the past few months been for you? How did uh, how did this pandemic impact you so far? Well, it's it's definitely been different. Um, I, I would say actually, normally I travel a lot, um, at least three times a month, four times a month, and so last six months no travel. It's a very different feeling. Um, it's it's good to get work done, but you know I, I miss the part of work that is going to conferences, going to visit potential customers for Covariant, potential partners. Um, I mean, Zoom calls are great, but I think in person is yeah. is next. Well, it's it's odd to hear someone from Silicon Valley say something like this because you guys are are already have got have gotten used to working remotely already, no? from way before this pandemic? I think the most common thread probably at most of the kind of tech companies is that people are more productive than before. Um, so if anything, people feel too productive because uh, there's nothing else to do. And you can work from home pretty much just as well as you can work from the office. So and you have nothing else you can do. So people are just, you know, working even more than they otherwise would and forgetting to take any time off because, you know, there's not that many options of things to do if you were to take time off. Right. So yeah, most people's fear is they're too productive. <laughs> What about yourself? Um, yeah, I feel pretty productive. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you always and right now um, you still you still seem really down to earth and easygoing. Uh, why is that? I mean, most people I talk to in, the, in these times they're they're quite stressful. I would say they're definitely stressful times. There's there's no doubt about it. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things that are different. Um, part of it is that I just think you know you try to do your best. And, you know, what, whatever happens, happens and just, you know, know that I'm doing my best, best what I can and then, you know, see what happens. Right, right. So how do you think that this way of working, working remotely is going to reshape Silicon Valley? There's a couple of things that are very different. So one thing is, let's say the day to day engineering work, right? You're remote, you're working from home. But with things like Slack and Zoom, you can communicate pretty well. So I think pure kind of day-to-day -day productivity wise, it's, it's pretty good. In fact, it's probably more productive. But if, keep thinking on the engineering side, um, the casual conversations are not as much there. And right. so at least in my mind, there's a little bit of a fear that even though it feels very productive day to day, then the kind of connections you build, but also the kind of casual conversations leading to new ideas that you otherwise wouldn't have thought of, or somebody giving you feedback on something you're working on who now wouldn't give you feedback because you don't run across them. I think those kind of things can actually be pretty big productivity boosts. Yeah. In fact, game changers very often. And so I'm a little worried we're missing out on those. I mean, of course, everybody's trying to achieve those digitally, but I don't think we're there yet, and so I'm quite worried about missing out on those. Another thing I'm kind of worried about is just social aspects. For a lot of people, especially in Silicon Valley, they work a lot. And, you know, as much as we should try to have a social life outside of work, a lot of our social life is also at work for many people. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that, that's going missing quite a bit. Where I see a very big difference than, um, I think is, is probably there to stay is on the sales side of things, meeting customers, meeting partners. I think before this pandemic, you know, not flying out to meet a customer or partner in person would seem like you're not prioritizing them. 
right? Because I mean, if, if they matter to you, you should fly out there. Um, but right now you can't really fly places, so you can meet them remotely and it's clear you're prioritizing them. It's just the best you can do right now. And so there, I think a lot of time is saved, a lot less air travel needed. So that's really nice, but I also think that will stick quite a bit. I think there'll be a notion that people are now sufficiently familiar with video calls, sufficiently comfortable that it feels okay to right. do a lot over video call rather than you know traveling a day, traveling a day back um, to meet a partner. Yeah, psychologically, I mean, I was just out with people in like a brainstorm session and I felt so awkward. It was like I no longer knew how to interact or like <laughs> interact yeah. with, with people. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's it's strange because you're so used to, you know, being behind a computer and then all of a sudden you, you talk to somebody in person and then, I mean, when you talk to somebody in person, there's also this added novelty of you're wearing a mask. And so now yeah. you just feel like, aren't you even hearing me? Because my voice is kind of going into the mask. Like it, it, it's, yeah, it, it'll, it takes some getting used to, <laughs> to, to, interact with people in person. Yeah, yeah, and you mentioned like, uh, usually you fly out to see, to see customers and partners, but what about teaching? Because you're a teacher at Berkeley. What do you teach again? And um, how are you teaching class right now? Yeah, so it all changed middle of last semester. Um, the class, I teach a bunch of classes. So I teach the artificial intelligence class. I teach the robotics class. I teach the somewhat more specialized deep unsupervised learning class. And so last semester I was teaching deep unsupervised learning and it's pretty specialized. And a big part of it is that I like to connect to students. And so I teach it in one block, a three hour block, but then we take a 20 minute to half hour break in the middle for people to get to know each other. Um, we do it in the evening, get food. So it's kind of fun, a lot of connections build. And it's then- still physically. Physically, it was happening physically in January and February. Yeah. But then in March, it switched to all remote. And so definitely lost that connection building aspect quite a bit in the process. There's nothing like, you know, connecting over having food together. And so lost that. I would say overall though, I mean, a, a lot of, most of our lectures are already recorded even when we teach in person and that specific class, people come in for the connection building and so forth. But for a lot of the classes at Berkeley, they're bigger. There's 100 plus people. It's harder to connect anyway. And a lot of students just watch them from home, um, right. even before the pandemic. So it's not that big a change in, in that regard. Um, but yeah, for the smaller classes where a lot of it is connection building, it's, it's pretty sad to not be able to do that. Um, yeah, but it is what it is. I think... I think overall people learn just fine this yeah. way, but again, the connections are just as important. Connecting two PhD students from different labs, one works maybe in computer vision, the other one works in natural language processing. They both need deep unsupervised learning. They right. start talking, they find connections, new ideas. So, so that's something that um, requires a lot of extra attention. To Is there make still sure cross-pollination? Is that still happening? Like people connecting? Well, I mean, for my own lab, for example, at Berkeley, I did a lot of things. So, for example, over summer, if I think through the kind of weekly schedule, um, every, every Monday there was a, so my lab is about 20 undergraduate researchers, 20 PhD students, and five postdocs. And so every Monday there was a session, a one hour session for just the undergrads. Right. where they're in breakouts of just three or four students and it's an hour to just exchange ideas talk to each other what they're research about what they're researching every tuesday there was one for all the phd students and postdocs then um every wednesday there was a lab meeting then later in the day on wednesday there was a lab meeting dedicated to the undergraduate researchers and me then also monday and wednesday we had a social in the form of a workout. So we had a trainer who through Zoom would go through a 45 minute workout with us. 
Then on Thursday, we had reading group um, and we had a social which was playing games online with each other. And then Friday, there was another social, but one without me for just the students. And so scheduled a lot of things to make sure people are connecting or have a good chance to connect every day. And also once people are connected every day, it makes the barrier a lot, a lot lower barrier to just reach out and say, hey, you know, you now know everybody so well, so you're more comfortable reaching out and setting up something on your own. But yeah, yeah a lot of effort's been going into that. And you're not suffering from Zoom fatigue? <laughs> well, here, here's the thing. I, th I think obviously um, the professors suffer from Zoom fatigue because as a professor, what you do is you have meetings all day, similar as, you know, if when you're at Covariant, we have similar things. Um, if you are somebody who constantly meets with customers, you're suffering from Zoom fatigue. But um, most, I mean, pretty much the entire engineering team and same for the researchers at, at Berkeley, they're working on their own pretty much all day. Like engineering and research is usually a pretty, like I wouldn't say lonely, but alone effort. You're thinking, you're coding, you're thinking. And so for most engineers and researchers, it might be the one hour a day or two hours a day that it mixes things up. And so even though to me, it might feel like it's yet another one out of, you know, a 10 hour sequence, it's important because for everybody who's doing individual work, it's the one hour a day or two hours a day. Yeah. Yeah, well, you mentioned Covariant and your, your company seems to be doing pretty well, right? Yeah, things are going well at Covariant. I think if anything, the pandemic has shown to us is, um, our, I mean, nobody ever thinks about supply chains. Like everybody just assumes everything's going to be there. You go to the grocery store, you assume it's there. You go to, I don't know, home improvement store, you assume everything's there. But actually, the amount of work that happens behind the scenes to ensure everything shows up at the grocery store or at restaurants when restaurants are open and so forth. It's, it's a lot, it, it's enormous. And at Covariant, what we do is we help essentially make the supply chain more efficient. And a big part of what we look at is distribution centers. So anytime you click to buy something online, um, if it gets delivered to you from let's say Amazon, they have distribution centers or they tend to call them fulfillment centers, but really the same thing, where everything is stored for your region. And then something has to be taken out of storage, put into the, the package that's gonna be shipped to you and shipped off. Right. But actually even before that, other things happen, a truck arrives, truck gets unloaded, things get unpacked, gets put into storage, and then it gets retrieved for your order, gets put into a package, shipped off. All those touches, I mean, there's often 10 plus touches to each item from arrival to, to getting to, I mean, arrival at the distribution center to arriving at your house. And those things are non-trivial. Um, and especially with a pandemic where people cannot be close to each other working in a warehouse, uh, it becomes very tricky very quickly. Yeah. And so at Covariant, we're really focused on making that a lot more resilient. How to interleave robots with workers to make it safer and a lot more efficient. Yeah, yeah. Human labor, uh, do you think it will eventually disappear entirely? Entirely? Well, I mean, it, it's a good question. I mean, we watch sci-fi movies like WALL-E. We see, you know, humans just being entertained. Um, obviously, there they're also unhealthy and, and so <laughs> forth. But um, it's hard to predict these things. Like, I wouldn't say I'm a good predictor of, yeah. of the future in that sense. But if I kind of just look at the near term trends, I do see a trend where the kind of things that people find dull and boring, um, and we think about dull and boring as like repetitive things, um, like picking things from a shelf and putting it in a box. Um, those kind of things I think will be more and more automated because when we talk with people running the warehouses, essentially they tell us, yeah, you know, people just don't show up to work and say, why don't they show up? Well, this is not the job they want to do. They want to do a different job and yeah. they're doing it today, but then tomorrow they, you know, they've already been applying to other jobs and then, you know, they just disappear. Yeah. And then, you know, you get disrupted. You don't get to ship the things you need to ship. I guess I'm pretty optimistic that, you know, we, we will get to a stage where we can automate a lot of these things. 
and be more robust in the process and that more interesting things will show up for people to do things that are sometimes cognitively more challenging and so more fun for people to do right have you read the article in the guardian that was entirely written by a robot well that's scary for yeah. my job <laughs> yeah i mean there's a couple of things to think there so one is to think about that article in the guardian it's it's massively hyped up right if, if you use gpt3 gpt3 is the technology behind it right which is a technology developed at OpenAI that is essentially trained on generating text. I mean, it's trained to generate the same text that's already on the internet, All right? And so you, it looks at a lot of text, you give it the first sentence of an article and it tries to generate the remainder of the article, things like that. And so you can then give it a prompt and you can say, hey, here's the first two sentences. Now hopefully it writes the remainder. That's kind of the, the state in which it is today. But what you get is typically not what you want. So if you look at the details of what actually happened behind the scenes, you can't just write two sentences and generate the article. You write two sentences, it tries to write the article automatically, it's not good. You change the sentences, you see what it generates now, you let it generate again. And so it's actually still quite a bit of work uh, to, to get it to write that article. Of course, you know, it's, it's, it's not as good a story if you say it's just as much work to do it this way than it is to write it yourself. And so that's not how people write it. People hype it all up. That said, there, there's some truth behind the hype. And now the trend is going in that direction, right? The trend is going in the direction that it's, it's not just a spell checker anymore. It's not just a grammar checker anymore. It's able to start completing some of your sentences. Right. It's able to generate variations on things you write and you might like that variation better. And that is today. And given, you know, we went from spell checkers and grammar checkers a few years ago and now it can generate variations and generate completions. Not exactly what you want, but getting closer. I do think it's going in that direction where it can help out a lot in, yeah. in generating content. Yeah. For sure. Well, both in Belgium and in the US, you're kind of famous for um, making robots think like humans. Um, how do you feel uh, about what you've accomplished so far? When I think about things I've accomplished so far, there's, there's a couple of things that come to mind. So first, the, the most natural way to think of it is to literally look at the accomplishments, right? Then I look at, okay, I did my uh, PhD at Stanford. We pioneered some, you know, many of the first results in how to make robots learn. And so at the time when I started my PhD, it was really funny because my PhD advisor, Andrew Ng, he said, hey, I think in a big new application domain for machine learning, where we should do research is robotics. And at the time, nobody in robotics was doing learning, nobody. Um, Andrew had done a little bit of it for his own PhD at the very end of his own PhD. And he said, you know, this is the new direction. What do you think? Do you want to work on this together? I was like, this is kind of crazy. Nobody else is working on it, but that's also what research is about. It's about doing things nobody else is doing. So we started doing that. And then six years later, by the end of my PhD, we were still only, you know, one of a few groups in the world that were doing robot learning. It was maybe a handful at that point. But I think that's really changed. And I became professor at Berkeley and this started growing. And I think, so one accomplishment that I'm pretty excited about is that we really help lay the foundations showing that there's a lot possible at the intersection of machine learning and robotics and to make robots learn. And now if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because I mean, how could you imagine robots not learning? I mean, of course robots should be learning, right. but it was not something people thought was possible yet. People thought, you know, yes, the future, but maybe not today. So I'm, I'm very happy about, you know, helping make that transition. It's also a good story from uh, Braschat to Berkeley. I mean, to Stanford, but. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of background, I think, yeah, I, I, I grew up in Braschat, not too far from Antwerp. Um, then went to Leuven for my undergrad. I studied Burlick Ingenieur Electronica in Leuven. From there, went on to Stanford to do a master's and then PhD in artificial intelligence. 
and now I'm a professor at, at Berkeley. And if, if I think about, you know, accomplishments, the, the earlier question, I think a big part of what made it possible is that I think the education we have in Belgium is really, really good. Um, people, people told me, you know, my professors in Leuven told me, hey, when you get to Stanford, don't worry. It's the best of the best, it's, you know, but you're going to go in very prepared. And I was like, well, who knows? You know, I'm sure they're very proud of what we're doing in Belgium. That makes sense. But, you know, who knows if I'm really that prepared because people come from all over the world uh, to come to this one place. I mean, there's a few places like that, Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, that seem to attract, you know, people from the entire world to, to go study computer science and other, other things there. But they were right. When I got there, I felt really prepared and ready to learn all the new things that was being taught there. Then one of the things that is just so different is you're surrounded by people who are all super ambitious. I would say the biggest difference to me between Stanford and let's say Leuven is at least the feeling I had studying in Leuven is maybe like, you know, 5% of us studying there, um, the nerds or the geeks, whatever you want to call it, are, you know, very excited about everything we're studying. But the 95% is like, okay, it's important for me to study this because it's going to get me a degree and a job, but only I'm here to have, you know, fun and to party and, you know, sure, I'll do, I'll do what I need to do to, to, to pass my classes and to get my degree and to get a good job, but ultimately, you know, the real excitement is in the parties. <laughs> and so yeah. coming to the U.S., a place like Stanford, Berkeley, I think I'm sure the parties are very important at most schools in the U.S. too, but it's just like, you know, it's like the 5% is all put into the same school. Yeah. And the entire school is made up of that 5%. Also because of the money. I wouldn't say it's because of the money. Um, these schools are set up in a way that they support the students really well. So there's a lot of scholarships. There's a lot of students who come from backgrounds where they can't afford the schools and the schools completely support them. I'd say about like 50% of the students at places like Stanford, Berkeley and so forth, they're pretty much entirely on scholarship. I think it's, um, it's really a, it's because it's a big country and a big world and it's kind of a self-selection, I would say. Yeah. And there is party schools and there are schools where people just really want to learn. And everybody just is excited to learn and super ambitious. And it gives you just a different feel. Um, you're constantly surrounded by people who are excited to learn. They want to do research. They want to start companies, build their own companies. Uh, it's, it's just, it, it feels very different. Right. Do you miss Belgium sometimes? Of course. I mean, there's a lot to miss about Belgium. Belgium is, yeah, <laughs> Belgium is a great place. Um, I think Belgium has a lot of advantages over many, many countries. I mean, just, I mean, for one, I mean, of course, the place you grow up, you know, you know people really well, you miss your family, you miss your friends from growing up. And that, that's, of course, one of the big parts. But there's other things that are really great about Belgium that I think, you know, are big advantages. One of them is, I think, it, I mean, obviously it's not 100% true, but, you know, country like Belgium, nobody's left behind. Um, there is a safety net in place. There is a culture in place, you know, that simple things that we take for granted in Belgium that are not simply in other places, even the U.S., which is supposed to be, you know, an advanced country, um, you, like healthcare. healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Going to a doctor in Belgium is a no-brainer. You don't feel good, you go to a doctor. There is health insurance. It gets covered and you get better, you know? It, it's a basic human right, I would say. It should be. Yeah. Um, but in the U.S., you know, if... Not so much. Your, your health insurance is tied to your job. If you have a job, you have health insurance. If you don't have a job, traditionally, you don't have health insurance. And now you have to pay out of pocket or you have to pay for your own health insurance, but it's very expensive to pay for your own health insurance. Yeah. And of course, Obama put things in place to fix that. But then, you know, a lot of people try to destroy what he put in place and, you know, feel like, you know, if you can't pay your own health insurance, you don't have a job, you know, too bad for you. Yeah. It's not how I feel. I think, you know, everybody should have health insurance. It, everybody should be able to go to a doctor and those are kind of basic things that just are so different 
and that in Belgium you can take for granted. You, you can go to a doctor, you be taken care of. I mean, I remember a story, we, I was traveling, I was in Belgium with my now wife and she needed to go to a hospital in Belgium for something, you know, something came up, we need to go to a hospital. And she, had, she even had no insurance, right? And so even though she had no insurance, the full cost of, you know, spend, spending five days in the hospital with no insurance was still cheaper than with insurance in the US. And so it's just a night and day difference. And I, th I think that's a really important one um, that, you know, I think fundamentally would be great to have everywhere. Yeah, yeah you guys were gonna get married here, right? Yeah, this summer we were supposed to have our second wedding in, uh, in Belgium, but yeah, that got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, not canceled, they got postponed. Yeah. So hopefully uh, next effect. summer or summer after. Yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> you're also quite famous for being the guy who col collaborated with Elon Musk. I'm wondering, do you have any anecdotes or uh, interesting stories to share? Yeah, so I think it's pretty interesting because um, I, I really admire him. I think like a lot of people, and that's probably why you're asking this question. It's, I would say, obviously there's a lot of people who have built successful companies. A lot of successful, I mean, all successful companies are a lot of work. Like yeah. you don't build a big successful companies without putting in the effort, let me be clear. But I think a lot of them involve maybe a good amount of luck, you know? If you look at a company like Facebook, it's like, of course, there's some smart decisions, but you're the one that takes off first, right? And, you know, it's at Harvard, it's prestigious, it takes off, others want it too, you know, that's great. They need to do all that hard work, but then, you know, the company just happens. If you look at Elon Musk's companies, they are things that don't rely on this kind of luck to be first. He's not even hiding what he's doing. He's just telling people, look, <laughs> we need better rockets. You know, we need to put satellites in space, we need to go to Mars. He says, that's what I'm gonna do. He thinks through it very carefully, builds out the company. Climate change, we need electric vehicles, we need solar, we need better batteries, all those things. He thinks about it very carefully and he builds a company that makes it happen. And I just absolutely admire his ability to really see the future. I would say see what just has to be there for us in the future and has to be there for the whole world to have a better life. Long-term thinking. And that's why he's so successful. And that's what always attracts me when I'm having conversations with him is that he has such a clear view on the future and what we need as humanity to possibly just survive because climate change could kill us all, but also live better lives. And he really thinks about that very carefully. And obviously you hear all the stories about, you know, working for Elon Musk, you have to work super hard. It's almost insane. Like, you know, who can put up with that? But the truth is people want to do it. And the reason people want to do it is because the mission, the vision and his leadership, like he has the right mission, the right vision, and he knows how to organize large efforts to work towards those things with milestones, work your way there. And I think it's, honestly, I think it's unprecedented. I, and I don't know anybody who can do the same thing right now. I don't know anybody in the world who can articulate those visions that are so important. You, you guys still working together? So the way, I, I mean, obviously I know Elon Musk from the news like everybody else, but then the way I actually got to know him was through OpenAI. So OpenAI is the, you know, of course he's much be better known from, you know, PayPal and Tesla and SpaceX. But then in 2000, late 2015, um, he started being really worried about AI in the sense that, you know, AI is going to do great things, but it's also going to be very yeah. powerful. And I think that's going to kill us all. <laughs> can go wrong. Yeah. And so at the time he actually organized a dinner and his first dinner I was not part of, 
but he got a bunch of people together at the time and he said, I'm really worried about this. I want to make sure it's for good. And we should start something new, which became OpenAI. But actually the way OpenAI came together is, it's one thing to have the vision. Okay, we need to make sure it's for good. But actually the only way you can play a role in it is by bringing the best AI researchers in the world together to work on this. And so the way we first connected was he then organized another dinner where he was trying to bring together a lot of the people he wanted to recruit to OpenAI as it was getting it started. And so that's the first time I, I really met him. Very interesting dinner. I mean, he really articulated well what he worries about and what he wants to do. But also at the time, also one of my students, uh, John Schulman, was about to get his PhD and he actually was the first one to commit as a researcher to OpenAI. And so he told me a lot about it too. And then um, my student actually played a very big role in recruiting me to OpenAI, saying, look, we're bringing a lot of the best people together. We love working together during you know, his PhD and that got me involved. And I remember initially we were just in uh, Greg Brockman, one of the founders apartment in San Francisco, just 12 of us in the apartment, you know, on our laptops, small apartment, um, you know, just sitting in the living room, couches in the kitchen table. And Elon would come by once a week, once every two weeks to just kind of get an update on what's going on and, you know, make sure that things are actually happening. And it was just, it was really inspiring. Cool. So what's his secret? <laughs> What's his secret? I would say, you know, I'm sure he has a lot more secrets than I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say his secret is to, as I perceive it, is to be able to think really, really hard about what are the most important problems for the world to work on. And once he's thought about that and he's, he's found these things that he believes based on a lot of first principles evidence that are the most important problems to work on and there's a path forward that allows him to tell that story to the most ambitious, most qualified people in the world and recruit them to join him on his mission and really go all out. He's a great and storyteller. <laughs> Great storyteller, but, but I mean, I think the funny thing is if, if you, I would actually put it a little differently because if you look at Elon Musk, as maybe a little less so now, but if you look at his interviews five, 10 years ago, and you don't know about him, let's say you don't know anything about his reputation, you just watch an interview, right? Your first impression would probably be, huh, that's, that's not the most fluent speaker. That's a bit awkward at times. There's all kind of pauses. It's, it's not the kind of, you know, super smooth talker. But nevertheless, after a while you realize you keep listening. And the reason you keep listening is because he's thought about things so hard that he has things to say that other people don't have to say. He has a real, he has a story to tell and he doesn't maybe tell it in the kind of, you know, professional storytelling fashion but it's clear how deep it is and that um, it's really important to him and he can explain why it's so important. Yeah, it's profound. So, exactly. yeah, so um, looking back, what's your biggest regret or mistake of your life that you now teach other people, your student for, students, for example, or maybe your wife or, or a friend to avoid? I think ultimately it tends to come down to time. All right, we only have so much time to do what we want to do. I mean, obviously, ideally, we maybe invent something we can live forever. And I don't think that's completely <laughs> impossible, but I don't think in my lifetime we'll invent something that allows us to live forever, but you, ne you never know. So I mean, it all comes down to time. When, when you feel like you spend a lot of time on something and it, it, was, it was a waste, right? Maybe... One example is I, work on a, I worked on a paper early on and it's very natural and you know you work on a paper and then it doesn't get accepted and you're just so upset because you worked on it for so long and then the 
conference yeah. rejected and you're just like, okay, this, this really sucks. Like you, you spend so much time in it, it's rejected. And you think, well, okay, I got this rejected. You say, fuck it. You know, I'm not working anymore this week. I'm going to do something else. But you know, that's stupid. Like that, that's just plain stupid. That is, you're just kind of like wasting your time because you're, you're, you know, you're letting somebody else's opinion influence, you know, how you think about the work. And of course you want to get people's input, but you know, it's just, you know, three people's opinion who might know less about this field than you do who happen to review your paper. And I think so, you know, le letting, letting other people's opinion get to you um, when you really shouldn't. I mean, obviously people can have good information, but kind of just letting other people get to you, um, I think is, is probably the thing that results in my case and, you know, waste of time in various cases that hopefully, you know, other people wouldn't waste time. <laughs> and I wish I hadn't wasted the time. So that, that's one. I'd say another big one is, I think when you take on big projects, very ambitious projects, you got to really be in it with a team where everybody's in it with the same expectations. And I think it's, it's very easy to make the mistake to project your own thinking onto other people. Different people have different priorities in life, different goals, different ways they want to achieve those goals. And I think other, other disappointments in my case often have come from kind of assuming things about people and I mean, I usually assume the best and so forth, but the best can, can mean different things for different people. Like maybe for one person, you know, being ambitious means working, you know, super hard 40 hours a week. And that's, you know, being super ambitious and they reflect the fact that they are super ambitious, but it's super ambitious in their way. And in my case, I'm not a huge believer that 40 hours a week, if you let's say build a startup or something is gonna get things done, right? You really need to push yourself harder, I think. There are exceptions always, but I think you improve your chances if you push things harder. And I think that's where I've been so fortunate with um, Great Scope and Coverant to have amazing uh, partners in these adventures. We really are aligned, but um, I've also had, I mean, I've had other projects in the past where I thought maybe they could go in that direction where I later realized, wow, I spent a lot of time, but actually, you know, my collaborators expectations are very different. And I think that's a lesson learned for me is to, to really, really fully understand people's motivations and drives uh, right. well ahead of time and yeah. not assume that, you know, they'll have the same drives and motivations. Well, especially in Silicon Valley, I mean, I can, I can, I can imagine there's a certain cultural difference when it comes to that. There's lots of competition from, uh, in terms of employers looking for talent. Absolutely. There's a lot of employers looking for talent. That, that's for sure. There's a lot of ambition, but there's still a lot of variation in that. I think, you know, everybody's different. Everybody has their own ways of doing things. And so I think it's, it, it, it's, it's important to really understand for everybody you work with, you know, what are their drives and what do they care about ultimately and to always you know understand what that is over time yes yeah. that's the way to be successful together and i think when, when you make assumptions without really understanding where people are coming from you you can often have you know very mismatched expectations what, what you're saying actually reminds me of one of the things from one of the interviews with elon musk i've read a while ago so i'm wondering is there anything you taught him or he taught you or advised you to do or not to do? Well, what, what he really taught me is to think, to think very hard about why you're doing the things you're doing. So it's very, you know, it's very well motivated. And the reason I'm saying that is because it's, it's very easy to just be motivated by success. There's a lot of ways to be successful. Like you, it's very easy to, you know, get to the next level in your career. I mean, it's not, I'm not easy is not the right way to put it. It's, there's always very many ways to get the net, to the next level in your career. And there's many, many things you can do, but to think very hard about what do you really want to achieve? What are the things that 
you want to do. And for me, the things I really want to do is kind of twofold. One is a lot of my drivers actually, and this goes to the earlier question in terms of what I try to achieve. A lot of my drive is actually about enabling other people. So I love working together with my students at Berkeley, making them become very, you know, competent world leading researchers. And so for me, even more than achieving the papers is the achieving my students becoming world leading researchers. But then from there, just as much, it's really exciting when those students actually decide that they want to take that research in a direction to commercialize it. Right. And so the things I'm most excited about are both helping my students become world leading researchers, but then also the ones who want to, some of them then become professors and start doing the same thing, but many of them have started companies at this point. Some of them I'm very involved in, some of them I'm less involved in, but I'm always super excited about that path and helping out. And so when I think about, you know, you want to be a mentor. Yeah, I love being a mentor. Um, I love having a very close relationship with the students even beyond when they're done at Berkeley. And I feel it's something, I think for a lot of people, once you do something for a while, you become better at it. You become more uniquely qualified at it. It becomes even more fun because you're doing something that very few other people can do and that, that makes it extra fun. And yeah. so I feel like it's, it's kind of a path. I'm going down that path and I see myself keep going down that path because you get more and more experience, becomes more and more fun. You can help people better as you get more experience. Cool, cool. It's really, I mean, it's, it's super inspiring actually because I'm now wondering what is your, what are you not good at? <laughs> well, there's a lot of things I'm not good at. Um, I think the secret to what makes me happy is, you know, spending a lot of time on the things I'm actually good at. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> pushing those really hard. But, you know, I, I remember, you know, going to school, we had class. I mean, I, I loved all my classes. I love learning, but there's definitely certain things I could not learn nearly as quickly as others. For example, music. I mean, back in high school, we had music. I mean, I had such a hard time learning anything about music. It was so difficult. <laughs> it was, it was not, a, not a natural talent, let's put it that way. Um, art, like we had art class and I mean, I was working so hard on art class and I had the lowest grade probably in the entire class while spending 10 times more hours than pretty much anybody else. It's just, you know, it didn't come naturally. That's the, and it hasn't come. <laughs> I still don't know how to do those things. And, and I enjoyed trying hard. I mean, I like trying hard, but you know, th those are the kind of things that definitely what wasn't good at at all. And you know, it's fine. You know, I think different people, different skills, it's, it's good to be different bit from other people. How do you, how do you unwind after a long stressful day? Because you mentioned the number of hours people work over the week. Yeah. So I think it changes over time. So back when I, I was a student still, my days, a lot of it was alone work. It's reading things, coding things up, analyzing experiments, repeat. And that kind of work is, I would say, a different level of intense because you're really zoned in on one thing all day, day after day after day. And when I did that kind of work, I really needed a lot of breaks because it's, it's mentally draining to do, be doing that same thing. I, I would you know, work for at most a two hour block and then I would need to go outside for 20 minutes, yeah. half an hour outside, get some fresh air, go for a walk, go for a run. I love playing basketball, love playing tennis, get some of that in to mix things up. And, you know, it, it was absolutely necessary to be able to focus again after that. And I would do a lot of interleaving of a lot of, I love sports. So a lot of sports interleave with the work I was doing, especially basketball and tennis and running. Cause those are the ones that I just you know, love doing. I would say as a founder of Covariant and as a professor at Berkeley, day to day life is a lot more varied. I mean, right now we're doing an interview 
that's very different from the next thing, which I'll, I'll meet with uh, one of my coworkers at Covarant to catch up on you know, what they're working on. Then a half hour later, I'll meet with another coworker at Covarant. Then you know, we'll have our all hands at Covarant where we you know, round up everything that's going on at the company. Then I'll have a meeting with our COO at Covariant to you know, brainstorm about next things that we want to do at a strategic level at Covariant. And so the day-to-day -day is very, very varied um, in the roles I'm in now. And yeah. so I think a, a, a lot of, I would say, burnout and getting tired with work, in my experience, comes from a combination of working on the same thing for very long. And then possibly if it's if it is less successful than hoped for. Because when you're very successful, it's easy to stay motivated. But in my case right now, it's like every day is so varied. Like if you look at my calendar, it's 20 different things every day. And so I, I think that makes it easy. That said, I still love trying to make sure I, I, I do probably at least an hour of sports a day to mix things up. My wife and I have dinner together every, every night, um, often lunch or breakfast, but you know, there's, there's a set time that, you know, we know we're going to have dinner together and hang out. Um, so it's, it's good, I think, to, to have those things that you can anchor mm -hmm. onto. So it's not just all work, but, you know, Films. my work is easy to spend a lot of time on because it's so varied. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. So my final questions, what are your hopes and aspirations for the future? Maybe in terms of AI or the world in general or your long term vision? Could be anything. Yeah, I think. Well, there's a, there's all the levels here. I think you know, I'm I'm really excited about mentoring the next generation, next next generation, and so forth of AI researchers and entrepreneurs. Right now, that means Great Scope, which is a company that does AI for helping teachers. Um, there's Covariant, but then there's other companies that are about to start and so forth that I'm not as involved in, but I'm going to you know, also be involved in mentoring the, the founders and so forth. Very excited about that. I think the beauty about new companies, startups, is that they can move a lot faster and make change more quickly. So I'm very excited about that. And same with research. You can move very fast, invent new things and at a different pace. This notion that as we develop more and more technology, assuming we of course manage it right, we can make our lives better, everybody life, everybody's lives better, and increase our standard of living. And so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that. Of course, there's always abuses of technology and you know we need to keep fighting that, but I'm pretty optimistic about that. And that's kind of my, my hope in terms of, you know, hopefully I can contribute to that, get us all to the next level, next level of standard of living. Clearly we are beyond where we were 500 years ago, hopefully beyond where we were 20 years ago, and hopefully we can keep uh, pushing this further along. And, you know, especially in today's world, I'm, I just, I just hope, you know, in general people, people can, you know, it's very hard times. Everybody has extra struggles in 2020, and no doubt. So, I, you know, I hope if everybody can have a better 2021. <laughs> I don't think 2020 was better than 2019 for most people. So, <laughs> it's a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> hopefully we can get that trend back on track that, you know, future years improve upon previous years. You know, we were going to do this interview in person. Yeah, we were. It would have been a lot of, lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sad about that. <laughs> but there's, I mean, worse stuff to, uh, to worry about, I guess. Peter, I just want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, yeah, I, had, I had a blast. Same here. Thank you, Magali. Wow, uh, ik vond het echt super tof om met Pieter te babbelen. Als jij dat ook vond, laat het mij zeker weten in de comments. En hopelijk ben je volgende week donderdag erbij voor een nieuw gesprek. Tot dan!